All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the um, our Bite Size PD today, which is Characteristics of Gifted Learners in the SALTA program. My name is Hallie Kirk, and I am our um, SALTA specialist, which is our Gifted and Talented Magnet program for Canyon School District. And today I'm going to share a little bit about our program and char characteristics of students who um, might be a good fit for referral. All right, so today um, my learning intention for you is that by the end of our session, you will understand the general characteristics of gifted learners. Um, they are not a monolith, so there can be a wide range in how they manifest, but there are some, um, some that are more common than others that I would like to share with you today. And then know how to differentiate between being gifted and being high ability, which there is overlap, but they are not always um, synonymous. And then know some of the basics of our program for gifted students in Canyons District, which is the SALTA program. And by the end of our session, uh, your success criteria is that you'd be able to recognize students that you work with in your role um, who may benefit from being tested or referred for testing for the program um, next year. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with just who are gifted learners. There are um, a wide range of definitions locally, nationally, even globally. The definition that Canyons uses is aligned to our state definition um, from USBE. And all of that really has come out of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So that quote up there about is the definition for giftedness that comes from that federal um, federal definition. And I think the important part to highlight is that these are students whose needs are not often met in the general education classroom. So while you can have a high um, ability in a, a wide range of areas, um, different domains and disciplines, these are students who also have um, needs that maybe not just academically, um, but also socially, socially and emotionally that are difficult to meet within the con confines of a typical classroom. So some of the features of gifted learners are that they're just wired differently. They um, learn and process information in a different way than their age level peers often do. Um, they experience something called asynchronous brain development, in which case their intellectual abilities develop much faster than their age level peers. Um, so critical thinking and reasoning, problem solving. However, their, um, their prefrontal cortex and their social emotional development may be delayed from what that of their average peers. And so it, there can be a mismatch um, in the way that those develop and a whole lot of characteristics and behaviors that transpire as a result of that. Um, it's important to note that gifted students are not necessarily gifted in all areas. In fact, it's more common for gifted students to be gifted in one domain than all domains, um, which makes it even more challenging to meet those needs. And then we're, when we're talking about gifted students in our district, we're typically looking at students who are, whose IQ is greater than 130. So that would put them in the 97th percentile in cognitive ability. Um, and that's, that's pretty common nationally. Um, and that's what we look for here in Canyons as well. Gifted students often perceive and react to the world in a different way. They have what are called, um, Dabronsky calls, overexcitabilities, where they experience their senses um, more intensely, and that can um, make it hard for them to learn if they're not appropriately regulated. And they also experience um, the world in a deeper way. So they may have questions about um, big picture, you know, existential issues when they're really young or have um, higher than average vocabulary and verbal ability, but really struggle to write and um, put that into put their thoughts and organize them into um, what we would see as being structured writing. Um, they do replenish their energy differently. They're di neurodivergent by definition. So they um, they they use and they expend and replenish their energy in, in different ways. And then the, it's also a um, common misconception that gifted students are always excellent in school. They're getting straight A's. They're the highest performers on all of your testing benchmarks and your end of unit tests. Um, however, and they can be. Um, however, many of them don't excel in school um, because they're not, the majority of what they're doing in school doesn't have to, um, doesn't necessarily align with their specific talents or the work can be too um, perceived as too remedial for them. It's not challenging enough. 
and or it um, if they can't do it perfectly the first time, they there's a lot of refusal and defiance to do work. Um, they struggle with executive functioning a lot of the time. So even being able to manage multiple tasks and get assignments in, these can all be barriers to success in school. And then they do often struggle socially if they're not with um, peers that share the same interests. So because a lot of um, gifted students have we're very specific kind of quirky interests. If they don't find peers that also share those interests in a deep way, um, they can be perceived. And also with asynchronous development, they can be perceived as being a little immature or a little off to um, their typical peers. And it can be hard for them to make friends. So I'm going to show you a video. This is kind of a stereotypical gifted student. Um, and I just want you to think about some of those features that I just shared of gifted learners and think about how they may apply to the student. All right, so I think that you can see how some of those um, incredible gifts and talents also correspond with something that might be perceived as a little bit socially awkward. Um, and and they're just a very unique population of students. So this again. Um, so here's some additional myths about gifted learners that I think are important to consider when we're um, trying to understand who gifted who might be gifted learner. So one is that they don't need help, they'll be fine on their own. Um, because of many of the characteristics that we just discussed, it's really difficult for them um, in a lot of typical uh, classroom contexts. So they do need support in developing some of the skills that they would have deficits with. However, at the same time, they do need support in being able to, um, to continue to develop their strengths and their talents. Often without having that um, perfect balance of the two and without having the support and being able to navigate that in a school setting, they lose interest in school. You'll see a lot of um, disengagement. You might, you'll see behavior um, resistance to doing assignments. And then um, as they lose their passion for being in school, there's all kinds of other issues um, may come up. So underachievement, even dropping out. 
Um, there's another myth that they make good peer teachers and role models, and sometimes they do. Um, but just to say that because you have mastered the content, you, your, your responsibility is now to teach all the other students in the class that content is a, something that, we, that we've seen happen a lot, and, and it's really detrimental to the right of a, any student to be able to learn at school every day. So these are students, again, who are, it's hard to meet their needs in a regular classroom. Um, there's also another myth that everyone's gifted and while everyone is you know, unique and, and everyone has talents and skills and, and can develop those, that's certainly true. But when we're talking about that 97th percentile in cognitive ability, um, we're really talking about an outlier um, it, within the population. Um, so that, that we're terming gifted. Acceleration being socially harmful is also a myth. We've got 30 years of research showing that it is um, an excellent intervention and strategy to meet the needs of gifted students, often by giving them content that's challenging at their level. They're meeting more intellectual peers and they're um, able to perform and um, have a better school experience. Sco students with failing grades and poor test scores can't be gifted. That's also a myth. We kind of talked about that already. Um, another big one is that gifted students are compliant and love going to school. And again, sometimes, yes, um, but not always. And I think that without needs being met um, or if they're, you know, they're hyper aware of their, their, their place and their role within their environment and how they're feeling. And if they don't feel like they're well, well understood, um, we will see a lot of um, adverse reactions to that experience. And then the last one is that gifted students can have disabilities. We actually have a, a large population, which we call twice exceptional students within a gifted magnet program. And these are students who, while cognitively um, and academically are high ability and achieving far above their peers in that 97th percentile, they may also have, um, you know, ADHD, be on the autism spectrum, have an other non-specified learning disability or difficulty with sensory regulation, um, you know, dyslexia, a lot of, there's a lot of overlap there. So I think it's important to understand and, and even in um, some districts and some um, school settings, giftedness al also falls within the special education department because you're really looking at, you know, the outliers of the general ed population. So I think it's important to understand you can be both. Um, you can go ahead and pause this and if you want to look over, these are again just some general features and characteristics of gifted learners from the National Association for Gifted Children. And just a reminder that not every student's going to fit, every gifted student's not going to meet all of these criteria, um, but I think I can give you a snapshot of what this might look like. So go ahead and pause and um, you can peruse that at your own, um, at your, on your own time. All right, so in the state of Utah, we do have within our Utah code, um, the Enhancement for Accelerated Students program. And this um, really establishes that all um, LEAs must have a method for identifying gifted students that would benefit from extended or accelerated opportunities so that they can grow annually at the highest level possible. So again, students that probably wouldn't be able to make those gains in a general ed classroom. Um, and that their acad academic achievement is accelerated based on multiple assessment instruments. So this is not just what English vocabulary that they've learned or how well they perform on um, a benchmark assessment. That would be more indication of achievement and learning that they've already um, attained. We're really looking for what their, their um, potential, what their aptitude for learning and how they think about problems. Um, and so that helps be more inclusive so that we can account for things like disabilities, um, students that are still acquiring language, proficiencies, cultural diverse per perspectives. All right, so in Canyons, our SALTA program goes from grades one through eight. In kindergarten, students can test in for the program and then they would begin in the first grade year. We have two elementary school sites, Peruvian Park and Sunrise, that house our gifted program. And then from there, our gifted program continues on to Midvale Middle School, at which point it dissipates um, as students go to high schools, so they're able to um, really align with what their content needs are. So we have like IB programs, AP classes, concurrent enrollment, um, that we might look at some acceleration. And then, um, from there, um, they can sort of specialize. So in the SALTA program, um, our mission statement is that advanced learners will engage complex and rigorous, engage in complex and rigorous content through deep learning experiences. So these deep learning experiences are the result of 
um, using what's called the depth and complexity framework. And that's a vertical differentiation strategy that helps um, help students take and teachers take content and look at it from different lenses and deepen their understanding of a topic and build connections across disciplines. Um, using that framework in combination with um, rigorous curriculum and, and having like rich text to work with or rich math tasks and real world problem solving, combining that with our SALTA performance standards, which include um, you know, practicing effective communication, metacognitive strategies, um, social emotional supports, which would be considered the effective domain, and then um, de helping develop some of those analytical and critical thinking skills. So by combining all of that, we're really deepening learning experiences. So it's really less about the product or the curriculum. It's much more about the process and how that how the students are engaging with the curriculum each day at school. Um, so a little bit more on that. Um, curriculum for gifted students should be differentiated at all levels of design. So this is every stage before, during, and after learning. Oftentimes we see gifted students um, in a typical classroom, they're, they're doing what everyone in their grade level peers are doing. And then when they finish it, they're given an additional assignment, which could be practiced with more of the same content, or sometimes they're rewarded with a project or um, some kind of high interest, um, you know, project-based learning unit. And it really should all be happening at the same time. So the outcome, um, the outcomes required of students, the activities and projects in which students engage in, the strategies educators are employing and the materials, all of that should be differentiated as we go. So what that would look like then is more flexibility in task, task complexity, giving students choice over, you know, do they want to attempt a mild, medium or spicy task? Um, giving them vertical differentiated lessons where they're all engaging in the same content, but they have different access points for it. Um, giving them options for working arrangements and ways that they wanna demonstrate their learning and how they wanna learn their content. So often gifted students or teachers of gifted students become more of a guide on the side or a, a coach of helping students in their own learning journey um, because a lot of the time they ha possess a lot more knowledge about a topic than um, their teacher might including me because I taught in the program and I experienced this. Um, we use a lot of pre-assessments to cur um, compact curriculum so that we can, don't need to do more of what they've already mastered and we have more time for um, quick and more time for quicker pacing and, and engaging in those deep learning experiences. Students and teachers become collaborators in learning. I kind of talked about that and then um, teachers will then modify content process and products to differentiate all across readiness and interest in learning profiles. So there's just a lot of um, more, a lot more flexibility in how students are engaging with content and how they're um, demonstrating what they've learned. And then there's really an emphasis on teaching for thinking and problem solving um, rather than being able to develop those more procedural rote skills. So we're really looking for not can you answer these questions within the context of um, something we've scaffolded heavily for you, but can you take what you know, those skills, and apply them into a novel setting um, that or a problem that you have not encountered before? So can you take what your skills are and transfer them? Um, so for our program, the primary assessment measure, and we do use multiple data points, but this is our, our first step um, when we do our testing in the fall, is we... Um, we administer the COGAT-7, which is a cognitive abilities test. And this is administered with the same age peers. The questions for kindergarten and first graders are read aloud. And the test takes approximately three hours. So for kindergarten and first grade, we split it into two sessions. So it's about an hour and a half each session. And then for second grade and up, it can be done in one setting and it's done on a Chromebook and it is self-paced. Um, our criteria, again, we're looking for that Usually it's the 97th percentile, but due to standard devi deviation and trying to meet our, our needs without having local norms, we're really looking at that 95th percentile within canyons. So the top 3% of students in cognitive ability. Um, in the fall, we right now our testing window is open. So it's open from September to, um, so right after Labor Day all the way until fall break. Parents can and families can go to our website and they can sign up to have their student tested. After that window closes, um, after October 5th, we then um, have our testing team go out to every school site and assess the students that have previously registered for the test. Um, so it's done during the regular school day at their regular school. 
And then that window um, takes us up until Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, we get all of our results back. We go through and we determine students that um, meet our qualification criterion. And, and determine if we have additional assessments we need to give, if we have multilingual learners that may benefit from um, looking at additional data points. Um, and then once we look through all of those families that um, we notify families of their students qualification status, if they qualify, we invite them to enroll in the program for the following school year. Um, this is kind of a timeline that I was talking through. So right now our registration is open, our testing window will occur, we'll look through results. We also do have an appeals window, so we notify families um, right before winter break. And in January, families have an option of, you know, if they think, you know, there was an off day for testing or there's additional um, information that we need to take into consideration, we do have a third party. Um, appeals committee that will then go through that in more depth with that student to determine whether or not it might be a good for, fit for them for the following school year. And then once um, families notify us of whether or not they intend to enroll in the program, we look through all of the applications and we try to make it as um, balanced between our two elementary magnet school sites and um, so that the class sizes are similar. We also look at things like our siblings already attending the school, where our families live, what are their boundary schools, um, and we notify families of where we can offer them placement. And then they would start within the program the following school year. Um, because we determine the number of teachers in our SALTA program annually based on how many students test into the program, this is why we do our testing so early in the school year, because we our FTE is allocated as a program um, so that any kid who qualifies for the service has the opportunity to go. So some years we might have more teachers in the program, some years we might have fewer. All right, so right now our window is open. Um, if you click on that link, and it's in the slides as well, uh, it will take you to our website and give you um, a link for that you can share with families for to register their child. It's um, you can if you have students that you think meet this criteria and might be a good fit. There's no, um, there you're not um, obliged to or even held to anything as a teacher to just recommend like, hey, I think that might be worth getting them tested. They just because they're tested, even if they qualify, doesn't mean need, they need to enroll in the program. Um, and it will allow us to code them in Skyward with a G, which indicates gifted. So whether they're in SALTA or not, um, it'll be as long as they're within our district, it'll at least be um, documented for teachers as they're working with them in the future. Um, and then it is free. So unless it's a student that's repeat testing and hasn't qualified, um, we do charge a small fee in that specific situation. Testing's free, there's no obligation to families. Um, and like I said, it's done during regular school hours at their current school. So um, feel free to bring that up with families at conferences. There are, um, our marketing went out. We have a parent square that's been announced um, twice. We have um, flyers around the district in multiple languages. And uh, if you need any other resources, they're available on our website or you can reach out to me directly. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about gifted learners, um, I do teach along with Angela Ovia, we teach our gifted and talented um, endorsement courses through UVU. So if that's something you're interested in, um, reach out to me as well. There's a couple of videos here and some resources that will provide, I, I think, some valuable information on giftedness, as well as our program um, website and our handbook, which goes a little bit more in depth than I was able to do this afternoon. So I hope that you learned something. Thank you for attending and um, have a wonderful afternoon.